Uh, next up, we have Kathleen Alexander. Um, she's from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, her field of study is computational materials science. Advisor is Christopher Shu, and her practicum was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Great. Well, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here talking to you today about the off-lattice kinetic Monte Carlo method that I developed during my PhD to study grain boundary kinetic processes. So before we really dive into the nitty gritty of that, I want to spend a couple minutes uh, introducing you to the field of grain boundary science and grain boundary engineering. So if you're already feel, uh, familiar with these topics, just kind of bear with me here. I'll get everybody up to speed. So when uh, a solid solidifies from the, the molten st state or from the melt, the, the first step in that process is the formation of these uh, of these little nuclei that you can think of as kind of tiny little Rubik's cubes that are randomly oriented or little grains, right? And those grains then grow as the melt continues to cool and eventually they meet up with one another. And the interfaces where they meet up have different orientations of these, of these grains and are the source, uh, are what we call grain boundaries. And grain boundaries are incredibly important, and so that's why we're talking about this today. And in particular, they're important because they, they play a really critical role in all kinds of materials processes and properties, including the uh, chemistry of a material and the mechanical and optical and magnetic and electrical and thermal properties. All of these things are highly impacted by grain boundaries. And of particular importance is the fact that they're really critical in materials failure. So specifically, they can often be the source and propagating path of things like cracking as well as corrosion. And so grain boundaries are, are really important when we're trying to design materials that are not going to fail in these sorts of catastrophic ways. However, this is not quite the entire story. So I told you that uh, when we form grain boundaries, we have these sort of randomly oriented kind of Rubik's Cube type things. But it is, in fact, the case that some grain boundaries may be, for example, the, oh, may be the source of you know, cracking failure. However, other grain boundaries with different orientations could, in fact, be resistant to failure and may be so resistant that a crack that's trying to propagate along some kind of intergranular path is forced to go transverse through the bulk of the material. And so the orientation space associated with grain boundaries is this is really vast geometric space. We have kind of five different parameters that describe how, uh, what a grain boundary, boundary orientation will look like. And Naturally, we might want to be able to engineer materials such that we have more grain boundaries that have these good kind of crack resistant, corrosion resistant properties and fewer of the susceptibility problems. And about 30 years ago, researchers actually started figuring out how to do this. And they were able to increase the fraction of grain boundaries in materials that were resistant to things like cracking so that, for example, this material that originally suffered from intergranular failure after grain boundary engineering then failed at a much higher, uh, exhibited much higher strength and actually failed plastically in this case. Um, uh, similarly, with this case of intergranular corrosion after grain boundary engineering, so shifting the percentage of fractions of different kinds of grain boundaries in the structure, they were able to generate a material that was essentially um, immune to corrosion failure. And so this is a, this is a pretty exciting thing, right? These, here's this thing that we all thought were like these defects in materials, they're the source of failure, and it turns out we can, engine, by changing which kinds of grain boundaries are present in a material, we can wind up with materials with wildly better properties than we, than we started with. Um, how, and so kind of early in the, in the work of grain boundary engineering, there were some early successes of this kind of thing that we're seeing here. But the field has kind of stagnated in, in recent years. And the reason for that is that we don't actually know which grain boundaries, which of those orientations are going to map to the properties that we want to see. And so we can't engineer some kind of microstructure with specific kinds of grain boundaries, except for in a couple of very specific cases. So we need some predictive relationship that's going to tell us what orientations of grain boundaries are going to give us 
what kind of set of properties. And uh, so traditionally, if you want to if you want to try and figure out what kind of properties a grain boundary is going to have, it's, there's this very involved process of forming what's called a bicrystal. So you make just you know one grain and another grain, and you sent, you stick them together. And then you do this you know, very long, involved experiment to try and drive that grain boundary to do something so you can measure something about its properties. Now, this is absolutely not a high throughput method. And if we want to try and probe the five parameter orientation space of grain boundaries, we're not going to be able to do it this way. And hopefully, everyone in this room is thinking with me, why don't we use some computers to solve this problem? And so in the field of computational material science, you have this whole kind of toolbox of different methods available to you. We can look at things you know, down at the spatial resolution of electronic structure, up through length scales on the, that are essentially infinite in time scale, or time scales that are you know, essentially infinite. However, the kinetic processes of grain boundaries live right in this kind of no man's land region um, that we don't really have tools, actually, that can, that can access these sorts of things. Um, and so the, the question that motivated my thesis work was, can an off-lattice kinetic Monte Carlo method fill this gap? Now, the off-lattice piece of that is what lets us access atomistic level resolution, like we get with molecular dynamics. So in the x direction, that's about where we're sitting. But it's the kinetic Monte Carlo piece of that, that and the stochastic nature of those simulations that is going to let us access hopefully longer time scales and push up in to that sort of experimental um, time scale that will let us access things like grain boundary properties. And of particular interest um, for uh, us doing computational science is the fact that because we're talking about a Monte Carlo type method, we're talking we're naturally talking about you know ensembles of simulations that are going to let us very straightforwardly parallelize these things to really uh, make use of large computing clusters that, for example, things like molecular dynamics, which are spatially parallelized as opposed to temporally parallelized, really can't take advantage of, a, you know, to the extent that these kinds of methods can. And so if we want to go ahead and build an off-lattice kinetic Monte Carlo method, um, the first thing I want to do is introduce you to this kind of example system of a grain boundary that we're gonna, that's going to kind of show up for the rest of this talk. So here we've got this copper grain boundary. It's about 2,000 atoms. And I'm either going to show it sort of as this, in this bicrystal form or just looking at the grain boundary plane. And uh, so the first thing that we need to know if we're going to go for a kinetic Monte Carlo method is we have to introduce the topic of an energy landscape. So an energy landscape is this 3N dimensional space that, um, that essentially maps the uh, energy response of a system to perturbations and the position of some of a system with N atoms in any of these like three uh, spatial dimensions that they can travel. And so there are energy, not, there are wells on these um, energy landscapes where a configuration is going to be stable and small perturbations will always increase the energy of the system. And if we travel through some low energy pathway between two of these stable configurations, two of these energy wells, then we're going to pass through a transition state or a saddle point. And Kinetic Monte Carlo is difficult because this is a, a probabilistic method. And so it's going to require us to have something along the lines of a partition function, meaning that we need to, if we're going to do probability, we need to know all of the possible states, all the possible events that can happen to a system. So if we have some unknown energy landscape, and we need to be able to find where are these saddle points on that energy landscape, and which correspond to activation energies. Um, and then we need to be able to ensure that we have completely searched this energy landscape so that we're accurately calculating this partition function. Or um, in kinetic Monte Carlo, it's called essentially the residence time. Um, 
And so in order to ensure that we're finding all of the events on this energy landscape, uh, we need to be able to both compare different events, uh, tell them apart, catalog them. And so these, it's these things that make this a difficult process and is why nobody has, had really done it before effectively. And uh, fortunately, uh, the first of these challenges, this problem of finding, um, of finding transition states had been solved about 15 years prior to me getting involved in this project. And with the development of a method called the activation relaxation technique, there's a, a number of eigenvector following methods out there. This is just one of them. But essentially, these methods um, shoot for, for saddle points on an energy landscape based on the assumption that if you follow the lowest, uh, the lowest curvature of the Hessian matrix at some perturbed spot on your energy landscape that you might have a higher likelihood of finding a saddle point. So we have some you know, starting configuration, some ground state configuration, and we want to try and find the events that are around it. We can sort of randomly push or perturb you know, an atom in the system that kicks us out of kind of the minimum energy basin that we're sitting in. And then we follow the lowest curvature of the system along until we either find a saddle point or reach some failure criterion of the search method. And if we do this repeatedly, kind of randomly perturbing atoms over and over again, we have some method that lets us explore this landscape. However, the method doesn't tell us anything about when we were finished, right? Whether or not we found all the events. And it also doesn't really help us in terms of figuring out whether we found the same event more than one time. But again, if we're going to be able to calculate residence times, we need some quantitative way of ensuring that this energy landscape search process was complete. And so we spent quite a bit of time developing a framework that allowed us to ensure that we had, in fact, completely searched an unknown energy landscape in order to perform these kinetic Monte Carlo simulations. Um, so again, the, the convention was to kind of do this kind of random set of perturbations on your system. And instead, we realized that if we're going to have, if we're going to be confident about the residence times that we're calculating, we need to deterministically search the space accessible to a, to a system. And that involves, um, first and foremost, choosing some perturbation mesh of an appropriate density that lets us access all the events accessible to it. So optimizing what mesh we're going to use to perturb atoms on is a, is a big part of in ensuring that we have uh, sufficiently searched the space. And if we're going to implement that, then again, we need some method of ensuring that we can accurately compare one event to another. And the, um, there were a number of kind of methods that had been used th throughout the literature for in attempting to do this kind of thing, often you know, resorting to just comparing kind of the energy or, um, or topology of, of these events. And we ultimately went with a method that al allowed us to directly compare the displacements of all atoms associated in a given uh, kinetic event in order to uh, in order to categorize it. And this allowed us to quantitatively compare one event to another and then um, ensure that we were obtaining converged resonance times with a given uh, perturbation mesh. So in this case, uh, so we're looking at here how uh, resonance time that we calculate changes as a function of this perturbation mesh that we're using. And we show that, you know, OK, there's some finite number of perturbations we need to do and to essentially uh, have all of the relevant events associated with this system. Um, this wasn't something that had been previously done before. And it, this was a reason. And, was a main reason why Kinetic Monte Carlo actually wasn't really being used in these off-lattice systems, is that any time somebody would publish a paper in Kinetic Monte Carlo, everyone would, would say that you, know, you've, you haven't found all the events. And, and no, they never had kind of a, any uh, proof that they had, in fact. So um, this, uh, we think, will really allow the field to move forward significantly. Um, and as such, we are ready now to, to build our kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm. So the way this works is, so you have some system. Again, in this case, we're going to be talking about this example grain boundary. 
And you assign a local atomic environment to each unique atom in your, in your system of interest. Now, that's a, actually a very non-trivial step of this process that we don't have time to talk about today, but you do this. And then uh, in parallel with as many processors as, as you have access to, uh, you perturb each of these unique atoms on that minimally su uh, sufficient mesh. And then you use this art algorithm to determine whether or not a saddle point has been identified. And if it has, you check whether or not this is a unique transition that you've seen before. And if it is, you store it in your database. And you continue this until you have you know, uh, completely searched the system. And once that's done, now it, you can accurately calculate a residence time. And uh, it's time to do uh, kinetic Monte Carlo. And so you, again, on all the processors that you have access to, you randomly choose an event to, from your database. You push your system through that event, and now you have an ensemble of, um, of new systems that you continue this process with. Um, and as you're evolving your, uh, each of your events, you can calculate the time that elapsed um, using the resonance time algorithm and have a physical approximation of what the um, time associated with your simulation is. And so just to give you an idea of um, how powerful the, this method is, um, particularly with respect to low temperatures, um, we're just about out of time here, but um, in the case of a room temperature simulation, we can actually simu phys physically simulate on time scales on the order of a second, whereas at high temperatures, we're looking at simulating timescales on the order of you know, 0.1 nanoseconds. And so uh, if we're interested in low temperature physics, which we are because with molecular dynamics, we can already access what the physics at these higher temperatures, we can actually you know, look across nine orders of magnitude in terms of time scale at the physically relevant kinetics to, um, with this method. And so uh, we went ahead and you know, analyzed uh, simulations across a range of temperatures for this grain boundary and a number of others, uh, and looked at things like the diffusion behavior and the mobility behavior of the grain boundary that then give us you know, properties of how this grain boundary would behave. And if you apply this method, um, we'll just skip through to the conclusions. Um, but anyway, so we're in the process of applying this method to study a whole range of, of grain boundaries and filling out a database of that with the hope that uh, some of this work will then allow people to, to, deter, to find these predictive relationships of grain boundary structures and their properties, and hopefully you know, pushing forward this field to the next era of grain boundary engineering. And again, thanks, as everyone has already said, to the DOE uh, CSGF program. It's really given me a lot of latitude, I think, to pursue this project in a way that was meaningful to me. Um, and it, I'm happy to answer any questions if we have time.